This is the history that has like a river passed. The world began in madness. There was neither form nor cohesion. This is the state called the wild and it is changed without respite and potential without end. From the formless of the wild came the children of the world, called the primordials. They were twisted and far from human. When humanity arose, enslavement was its fate until the gods instructed the most noble amongst humanity to manipulate the essence of the universe. Those blessed were raised up above the base and the noble among their kind, and thus they were exalted. Chosen for nobility and virtue, the greatest spirits of heaven gave unto the chosen the gifts of the limitless sky. First among the celestials were the solars, the greatest in virtue. They were chosen to rule, to lead and to teach. It was they whom the spirits made mighty and they who were given the first share of responsibility for the moral guidance and edification of humanity. The unconquered son was their father and he lent them his wisdom. Next among the chosen stood the lunar exalted, Luna's sharp and stealthy children. Lieutenants to the solars, these were great generals and formidable sorcerers, the enforcers, the emissaries and the evangelists of the solar world. Lastly, there came the sidereal exalted, the sighted ones, the chosen of the five maidens, to take up the role of viziers and advisors to the old realm. Beneath the chosen were placed the more common terrestrial exalted, limited both in power and in virtue but still wise and possessed the might of the elemental dragons. The exalted were blessed by the unconquered sun, by Luna, by the five maidens and by the five great elemental dragons. The spirits sought not just to lift squalling humanity from the dust through the noble example of the exalted, but to vanquish the primordial demons and the outer darkness. In mighty tandem, the celestial and terrestrial exalted made war with sorcery, thunder and flame and they banished their primordial foes from the face of the civilized world. The chosen assumed their place as rulers, kings and wise men, while the terrestrial enforced their word. From that moment for ages on, the cosmic balance was perfect, and the solar kings nurtured the human race and guided its explorations across the face of the world. For centuries the old realm flourished, with exalted leading humanity from ignorance and savagery to knowledge and civilization. It is not the way of this quicksilver world for harmony to dwell over long, and the great realm contained the seeds of its own undoing. The dragon blood grew jealous of the chosen, and certain of the chosen were arrogant and lacked compassion. The dragon blood rose up like waves, and with treachery and elemental might sundered the celestial hegemony. The fate of the exalted of the sun was destruction. The fate of the exalted of the moon was exiled to the places of the wild. The fate of the exalted of the planets was victory, for their hands had guided the hands of the dragon-blooded. After much murder and making war, the dragon-blooded stood decimated but victorious. The echoes of treachery would not be still, the servants of the solars were wrathful at the terrestrial's perfidy, the spirits made war upon the realm then and there was no peace in creation. The stentorian din was deafening and the battle was cruel. Mountains trembled, cities fell, the terrestrials made use of the mighty artifacts of the very solar exalted they had slain, and by so doing they forced the raging demons away and caused the elementals to slumber in the world's far crags. By might and force, the dragon blood had claimed the realm's throne. Less in number than they once were, the terrestrials fought to tame the fractions and enraged provinces. The people's rebellion echoed the terrestrials' revolt, and harmony fell into chaos. The old realm was not surpassed, nor was it equaled, neither was it remade in any way. Dragonblooded quarreled with dragonblooded, and human fought with human, and nowhere was harmony nurtured. A grave peace enforced itself upon the coming of the Great Contagion. The dead became more numerous than the living, and cities fell into ruin. Sickness bested war. Death vanquished rebellion, progress, and the dragonblooded's rule. The people sickened and died. Nine men in ten tasted death. Sensing great weakness, the beasts of wood and the firefolk vigorous in the face of contagion swept over the cities from nests in the wild and brought cities down by the score. Hope of returning the glories of the old realm withered like blossoms in winter's relentless first frost. Across the realm the wild surged forth and extinguished what little light lingered. 
the sorcerer's moon children waxed ascendant, while the dragon blooded waned and retreated. It was humanity that acted as its own savior. Through relentless work and vigilance, the fields were plowed, planted, and reaped. The Scarlet Empress, the dynasty's matriarch, opened the doors to the Solar's great manse, repelling the wild the blessed isle was defended by sorcerers' protections of old. Strength fed aggression. The great sense of entitlement felt by the Scarlet Empress rendered her mad to control of the lands once possessed by the old realm. The Empress, with foes at the ready, made bargains better left unmade, her absence portends cycles change. With the end of the cycle of night comes the light of the cycle of day, the shows and return. The children of the sun and the moon and the maidens shall prevail, and the realm shall be as it was. This is the second sutra of the prescribed Blossom of Ages as presented in the core book for Exalted First Edition. Even earlier in the book we have an introductory fiction depicting a young solar running from a wild hunt among the glass towers of Chiaroscuro before turning to face her foes. For being the first introduction to Exalted when the world building was still young, it gives a deep insight into creation that is to a large degree unchanged throughout the editions. There are some major changes here and there, but not to the general foundation on which everything is built. The book makes it clear early that this isn't a typical fantasy game. It isn't Forgotten Realms, it's Exalted. In the previous video, I went into detail on the evolution of Exalted as a game line and how the themes and tone shifted throughout. In this video, I'm going to speak more general about Creation's world building, but also highlight how the world building was affected by these shifting tones. There have been controversies regarding the game's tone and world building in the past, and these controversies are important to understand in order to understand why certain changes were made in the current iteration of the game. Before we go any further into this video, I want to let you all know that I recently dropped the community content for Exalted 3rd Edition on the Storyteller's Vault. Ghost has rules for playing ghosts, including Death Lords, as well as new merits and over 200 Arcanoi on 76 pages. Even if you're not interested in playing ghosts, there are 94 Arcanoi with Eclipse keyword that you can use for your solar character. Also, I want to mention Ennefail's beautiful custom-made D10s that you can get over on a shop. I have a link in the description below for how you can get those dice in a way that also helps me out a bit. What's a better way to try out your new ghost character than with some new dice, right? Anyway, promotion over. The world of creation isn't like any other world. It was the first developer, Rob Hatch, who made initial sketches for how creation would look like and who pushed for the idea of having the world follow an elemental theme. The north would be frigid and cold, the east would be temperate and lush, the south would go from tropical to searing desert, and the west would be islands surrounded by vast ocean. In the center of it all was the blessed isle, with a tall mountain representing the elemental pole of earth. This central pole would also represent the stability of creation, with the further away from there you went, the closer you got to the chaotic wild. First edition also introduced most of the things that you associate with creation today, from shadowlands ruled over by death lords, to the borders of the wild inhabited by fair folk mutants and behemoths. First edition also wanted to make sure that the celestial incarnate were depicted as ruthless and tyrannical instead of simply wise and worthy of reverence. The divine hierarchy is portrayed as strict and competitive. And just like how the fair folk cannot easily sustain themselves in the material world, the spirits of creation need essence from domains or mortal prayers and offerings. Terrestrial spirits are daunt and act cults or see themselves as god kings have little influence in the world around them. On the blessed isle, these are restrained by the immaculate order, but many spirits reign free in the threshold. Because first edition needed to both outline the world building and define the game's themes and tone, it put a lot of effort into establishing the dichotomy between the antagonists of the realm and the protagonists of the Solar Exalted, while still emphasizing that things weren't black and white. The core book did this by adding an in-character description of the realm's history from the eyes of a realm historian. The Celestial Exalted are described as anathema, and the realm historian indicates that they used rituals to steal power from the spirits of the sky. Some of these interpretations are elaborated and modified a bit in future editions, but it's still a powerful tool to define the core game's primary conflict. A lot of space is dedicated to establishing the realm, its history and culture. 
Not much has changed throughout the editions other than further elaborating upon the realm and shifting its presentation to avoid traditional patriarchal themes and emphasizing that it's a matriarchal society. First edition depicts the threshold as a dangerous place where life is cheap and states are run by corrupt autocracies influenced by the realm. And apart from having to worry about violence and taxation, people must worry about local spirits. Many in the realm argue that life in the threshold is dependent upon the imperial legions, but that's where the scavenger lands come in. As I mentioned before, first edition uses a lot of word count to define the realm as the main antagonist for solar PCs. The scavenger lands and places like Nexus are also given a lot of word count. These are introduced as regions where players can explore exalted chronicles without fear of the wild hunt interrupting personal narratives and grand motivations. While the scavenger lands as a region has an elaborate write-up with a long history of conflicts with the realm, much of it is still left vague, especially the Hundred Kingdoms, which are portrayed as conceptual feudal states where storytellers can assert their own lands and conflicts. Creation is a large world, and there has never been the intention of the developers to map it all out. Individual regions are mapped out, especially around the Inner Sea, but much of the surrounding territory are elemental wastes and unsettled lands. Creation itself is huge, and it's easy for storytellers to add their own civilizations to blank spots. In fact, storytellers are encouraged to do so to make creation their own. Some areas have been further explored by future supplements and additions, but 3rd edition made the most drastic changes by not only increasing the size of all of creation, but starting to fill in more of the blanks itself. Since the 3rd edition setting book Across the Eight Directions hasn't been released yet, as of the making of this video, we can only speculate about some of the additions and changes that have yet to happen. First edition wanted to depict creation as a brutal world with a decadent realm in shambles after the disappearance of the Scarlet Empress and a wild threshold where you are just as likely to die to the elements themselves as you are to violence or the arrogance of local spirits. While the over-the-top anime aesthetic has been there from the start, first edition's worldbuilding was more focused on portraying the gritty reality of pulp fantasy classics like Conan and the fantastical and decadent tales of Greek mythology. Second edition didn't make many drastic changes to the overall foundation as established by first edition, but there was a radical tonal shift away from gritty pulp fantasy, while the anime aesthetic was emphasized even further. Much of this tonal shift happened even during first edition's run, but the most major changes could probably be explained in part due to the art direction of second edition, and that the original vision as outlined by Jeff Grabowski couldn't be upheld when John Chambers took over as lead developer. During second edition's run, many former fans were added as writers to the creative team, and the community at large had been influenced by the tonal shifts and more or less accepted Exalted as an anime game. But there was another reason for the tonal shift as well. A lot of content was published during 2nd edition, and the creative team had both time and interest in exploring the metaphysics of creation. By giving everything mechanics, like how the unconquered sun gets a stat block in Glories of the Most High, and by explaining and over-explaining every facet of creation's metaphysics, there was no mystery left for players to explore, there was nothing mythic left in the setting, and much of its appeal had gone with it. Third edition has made sure to emphasize the mysteries of creation once more, bringing back the mythic feel. Third edition made the most drastic changes to creation's world building than any other edition. They wanted to make creation more interesting, so they made it larger and filled the threshold with more diverse and interesting locales as well as new exile types such as exigents, liminals and getimians. They also wanted to take an active step towards returning to Jeff Grabowski's initial vision, so they hired him as a consultant on the core book, changed the art direction to move away from the anime aesthetic, and returned to using chapter fiction instead of the comics introduced with 2nd edition. While 3rd edition is still an over-the-top action fantasy, it's now rarely, if ever, referred to as an anime game. Exalted Essence doesn't elaborate on creation's worldbuilding, as it is produced in conjunction with 3rd edition. Instead, Essence relies on 3rd edition's worldbuilding, and only offers a narrow description of the larger setting. 
Instead of seeing Essence as an alternative edition to 3rd edition, it's better to approach it as an extension of 3rd edition that offers an alternative rule set. When it comes to the setting itself, 3rd edition and Essence are fundamentally the same. While it can be argued that 2nd edition was largely ruined by its tonal shift, many who were around during its run also argued that it was ruined by Metaplot. This isn't as black and white as some would assume. Second edition's metaplot was related to the return of the Scarlet Empress and the reclamation of the Joses. The Scarlet Empress has disappeared in every edition, but second edition had her disappearance be explained by her having become the bride of the Ebon Dragon, one of the Joses. The reclamation referred to the Joses' release upon creation. The main reason for why this metaplot was disliked was because of how the Joses overshadowed the PCs and everything became about the reclamation. In truth, 2nd edition wasn't harmed by this meta plot, because it happened very late during its run, and it only impacted those who wanted to run an Infernal's heavy game or the return of the Scarlet Empress scenario. For most groups, this meta plot had no impact at all, and it would surprise me if most casual groups even knew about it. So, for the average player, this wasn't an issue. Instead, you could argue that most meta plots that involve world shaking events would have the same impact. And because Exalted is a game where the PCs should be at center stage, then perhaps it would be better to present a more static setting that the PCs can make their own. The original developers of 3rd edition never intended to get rid of metaplots entirely though, and it was stated during development that the idea was to have an involving metaplot introduced in the game's fiction. But if you look at 3rd edition material today, there are no real indications of this meta plot, so it's possible that it isn't in the current developer's vision of the game, someone correct me if I'm wrong. Though there are suggestions for how certain aspects of the setting can change over time, such as the realm civil war, but that is more presented as storyteller device than actual meta plot. As a critique of 2nd edition's metaplot, 3rd edition wanted to reduce the Joseph's impact upon the narrative, so they removed the possibility of reclamation in the canon. They also wanted to mystify the first stage more, so they removed the term primordial in place of terms such as enemy of the gods or ancient. 2nd edition also fully elaborated on the first age through supplements such as dreams of the first age, which also emphasized the tonal shift by having first age artifice represented by futuristic magitech. 3rd edition went in the opposite direction and mystified the first age to a point where I personally think they took a step too far. First, primordial is a good term. Second, the consequences of mystifying the first stage too much is that the corruption and tyranny of the Solar Exalted became a mere footnote in their presentation. Because of how central the corruption of the Solar Exalted is to the game's primary conflict, this should have been explored more, show, don't tell. I cannot speak for the intentions of first edition's world building, apart from what has been stated by people like Jeff Grabowski. But I do know that a lot of care has been taken into the world building for 3rd edition. The goal is to portray diverse and realistic cultures, but also to highlight the actual cultures that inspire them. Not every part of a fantasy game is 100% original. Real life history and culture inspire fictional works. Most of the cultures in creation are mashups of real life ones. I did mention that Exalted Essence didn't put a lot of focus on introducing the setting other than the basics you need to play. However, it does offer sidebars with explanations for the inspirations behind the various cultural mashups, which is a good way to inform storytellers on how the creative team approaches world building in a way that could inspire them to do the same for their own games. For example, under the description of Northern City of Whitewall is a sidebar that explains that Whitewall is stylistically inspired by the Kievan Rus and Slavic fairy tales, while the ideas behind the city itself is inspired by the free cities of the Holy Roman Empire. The developers have put a lot of care into avoiding cultural appropriation, as well as the heteronormative standards of 21st century Western culture, at least after the release of the 3rd edition core book. They have hired a diverse staff and sensitivity readers. This doesn't mean that prejudice and oppression no longer exist, it's very real even in creation, but rather that it's depicted in a way that doesn't glorify it. Increased social awareness and a desire to have some escape from real life oppression, previous controversies, as well as the incorporation of new perspectives 
have all played part in some of the directions 3rd edition has taken in its world building. Jeff Grabowski was a history buff and had good intentions with wanting to avoid western influences, but the developers at the time were still operating from a whitewashed lens and there were limited if any outside perspectives. But this was the case for most game design at the time. Despite having a black woman on the cover of the first edition core book, Exalted was still a game written for a market dominated by the white American male. The game also came out at a time when mature themes were equivalent to show sex and boobs without nuance and without context. During the span of 3rd edition, there has been a lot of focus on social awareness, inclusivity and representation. Exalted and other White Wolf games have long had a large fan base of LGBTQ players, and 3rd edition wanted to make an active effort in turning creation into a more inclusive setting for that community. The new signature character Prince Diamond, a trans man, is depicted on the cover of the 3rd edition core book, and same-sex orientations as well as non-cisgender identities are normalized in the setting. More NPCs than before are portrayed as queer, trans or non-binary. The shape-shifting lunar exalted have been changed in 3rd edition to have their true form also represent their gender identity. 3rd edition is without a doubt the best edition if you're looking for a setting with a lot of representation and with a lot of care taken into its presentation. In recent works, more focus has been placed on disability awareness as well, which can be seen especially in the art direction of Exalted Essence and newer 3rd edition supplements. While all editions have had hits and misses when it comes to appropriation and representation of minority cultures, sexuality, sexual orientation, gender identity, disability and more, Second edition is largely known as the one with the most misses. It's also the blatantly horniest edition based on its art direction. Both first and second edition have a lot of descriptions of sexual violence, including against minors. This is most infamously known from second edition's description of Lillen in the Infernals and Malphias books, but it exists in other places as well. Lilun was a girl who was taken to hell to be abused and deformed, and who is essential in the creation of the Infernal Exalted according to 2nd edition lore. 1st edition's Aspect Book Wood introduces Sunnis Ambor, who abuses and murders children while dressed up as his mother, who in turn had abused him. Then we have the Lunar Lilith, who in 1st and 2nd edition is defined by her hatred for her solar maid Desus, who abused her physically and mentally using his solar charms. At the end of 2nd edition's run, many pointed at these examples, and many others, to argue that Exalted was a game that glorified sexual violence. This was further highlighted in an article on Something Awful, where many of these themes were discussed, but also how the game had rules that enabled sexual violence. I'm going to talk about rules more in another video, but the article correctly highlighted several examples of inappropriate content in Exalted 2nd Edition, as well as some at the time current controversies surrounding previews from the Kickstarter of Exalted 3rd Edition. For example, the former developers of 3rd Edition previewed an abyssal charm that allowed the character to use ghosts to sexual assault targets, and when called out, one of the developers basically told the community to fuck off. The actual Abyssal book for 3rd edition is now under development with new developers, so hopefully it will hold up to the high quality we've come to expect from the 3rd edition splat book so far. There's a link in the description below if you want to read the article in its entirety. If you're interested in investing a 2nd edition in particular, I think it's a good idea to read the article before making your purchase. When we're on the subject of controversies, and if you want to read more about them, then I recommend a master thesis written by Nils Martinström Josefsson in 2021 titled Sexy 16-Year-Old Baby Eater – Gendered, Sexualized and Racialized Discourses in Exalted Second Edition. It goes into many of these controversial subject matters, including the sexualized art direction from an academic perspective. There's a link to the thesis in the description below. It would take too long to go through every change that's happened between editions, but my personal opinion is that the game's world building has never been as good as it is in 3rd edition. While the production time for each book is much longer than it was for 1st and 2nd edition, the quality of 3rd edition material is superb. It has found its way back to the game line's roots and made creation more mythic in tone, while at the same time making strong efforts in social awareness and inclusivity, especially for players who are part of the LGBTQ community. Is it perfect? Definitely not, but it's the best version of Exalted out there. 
The problem is that 3rd edition isn't done yet. Much of the setting hasn't been explored yet in official material and the world building is an ongoing process. When I make lore videos on this channel, I use 3rd edition material and then fill the gaps with 1st edition material and sometimes sprinkle in some 2nd edition material if I feel that it isn't contradicted by newer material and if it fits the tone I'm looking for. I can do this because I've been part of the Exalted community for 15 years and have all the material. New players though, for them, 3rd edition will have major gaps. I have directed a lot of critique towards 2nd edition in this video. But there's a reason for why 2nd edition has a large player base even today. It is a more complete experience than 3rd edition, and many players are fans of the anime aesthetic and 2nd edition's general tone. There are parts of 2nd edition that have aged poorly, and other parts were always bad, but the group can always omit material they don't like. I wouldn't recommend the 2nd edition today, but I don't fault those who still play it. It was during 2nd edition that I was introduced to the game after all and I didn't mind its tone until I explored further and recognized what had been lost and the games I wanted to play. Exalted Essence has helped to make 3rd edition into a more complete experience though, since it makes every Exalt type playable and relies on 3rd edition lore. I'm not a fan of many of the changes Essence made, which I'll talk more about in an upcoming video, but I would much rather play Essence with 3rd edition lore than 2nd edition at this point. If a group wants a complete experience and doesn't mind a bit of homework, I would recommend that you play Exalted Essence for all Exal types, get 3rd edition books to use as lore, and then refer to 1st edition books to fill in the gaps not yet explored in 3rd edition. As for the rules themselves, we'll talk a bit more about that in upcoming videos. However, the focus of the next video is going to be on the player character and the player experience. What are the options for players in all editions, and what are the pros and cons of the player experience? If you watch this video when it comes out, that one should already be available on my Patreon, but will be available on YouTube in about a week. Until next time.